Ready. Okay. Um, welcome to the May 18th, 2021 uh, planning board meeting. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the planning board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by main law. The planning board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting to allow the public to remotely attend and, attend and participate. Zoom will allow all planning board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Okay, uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for the April 20th, May 4th, and May uh, March 16th uh, meetings. And the May 4th meeting was a special meeting, and the March 16th uh, meeting minutes are uh, revised. Uh, they were previously approved. We made a, a revision. Now, Maureen, before we, I ask for comments, can we do, do we need to vote on all three individually or should we, can we? Yes, you should, you should take one vote at a time. Okay, all right. So we'll start with the top one, the uh, April 20th uh, meeting minutes. Does anybody have any comments? Yes, uh, there's a typo, I believe on page two in the second to the last paragraph, okay. I believe. I believe it should say, he thinks the planning board should say the project is not possible, not it not possible. Where is it, page two? Page two, the second paragraph from the bottom, it begins Mario Magnoli. Oh, okay. Second line. Yep. Got it, I agree, yep. That's my only comment on. Anybody else? No comments. No comments. Okay. Uh, Motion to approve the minutes as amended. I'll second. Maureen, please take a vote. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Sorry. Chair Hubner? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, I think it's five, what, five to nothing? Yes, That's correct. Okay, next, uh, the May 4th, 2021 special meeting. Any comments? No. No. I have one. On page one, second to last paragraph, the, la the last sentence, she estimates five to six, but that is subject to factors we may not know of until an application is made. That's the way I think it should read. Anybody? I agree. Good catch. Also, also um, my copy has draft written on it. So I'm assuming that draft will be taken off. Yeah, yes. yeah it, it's, it's staring me right in the face, but I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> I go for the easy stuff, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, Maureen, please take a roll. Oh, wait. Motion to approve the oh. minutes oh, yeah. as amended. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll second. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, next to March 16th, 2021, revised, where uh, we, on the second, uh, well, it's page 10, um, and it's in red on my copy about uh the board instead of voting we was a which is it was a straw poll it wasn't a vote i mean any, any have any comments on that no other than i wish we had caught it before so so i we've got to be careful with our straw polls in the future i i boy you sound very mechanical to me and i don't think it's my hearing aid say it again carol ann i said we you need to be very careful about straw polls and be very explicit in the future. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, okay. so. any well, motions? I would move that the minutes of March 16th be amended on page 10 as set out in the, in the enclosure. Second. Maureen, please take a vote. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Ms. Gil Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Starbeck? Yes. Chair Hubner? 
Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Um, next item, new business, Town Farm Trail Resource Protection Permit. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to construct 1,100 square feet of boardwalk on the existing Town Farm Trail, R5-1113, Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection uh, Permit Completeness. Do we have somebody? We uh, do, um, and I'm uh, promoting him um, to panelist. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hey. Go ahead, Mitch. The, the the stage is yours. All right, cool. So we are, um, as you've heard, requesting a resource protection permit for 1,100 feet of boardwalk um, that is in the Town Farm Trail um, off Spurwick Ave. This is a very muddy area. Um, I think we spoke about it maybe four or five weeks ago during a uh, workshop. So I guess you know, I would just pose to you guys, if you have any questions, I think our proposal's very straightforward. Um, yeah, thank you, Maureen. Photos of the area that we're, that we're discussing. Um, it's really impassable and causing some erosion. Um, it's kind of embarrassing for the Conservation Committee to have this out there. Um, so we need to get it fixed. We also have two Eagle Scouts who have come forward looking for Eagle Scout projects uh, for this summer. And we are very hopeful that we can divide uh, these bridges in half and our two young fellows can, can take care of them for us. Okay. Um, all right, do you wanna, uh, I need, I'm trying to go on through my stuff. Was there a layout? Yeah, we have a layout. You don't know if you have that there, you can walk us through it. Um, it would be a four by four piece of lumber on the ground, four feet wide with three pieces of parallel decking um, atop it. No, I mean the, uh, like a site plan is what I meant. Um, I can throw one in here. Oh, I'm sure we do. Um, see. Maureen, page, uh, page 23 of the document you're scrolling has it. Okay. Yeah. So these are the locations of the boardwalks um, covered as part of this uh, re RP permit. All right. I have walked that site and it was about several months ago and it was bad then, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and the, let's see, we got the resource protection permit. Um, I guess, do you have any other comments, Mitch? I don't. The conservation committee is in full support of this project, which is why we sent you the permit. And I think a comment that we support the project. Okay. Um, then I'd get, I'll open this to public comment. Um, so if anybody from the public wishes to speak, uh, please raise your hand, use the raise hand feature on Zoom, I should say, and Maureen will recognize you. And you can speak. Of course, I should. See. You see anybody, Maureen? I just had no. Okay. All right. Going once. Going twice. Okay. The uh, public comment period is closed. So this um, this uh, planning board. This is for a finding of completeness, not necessarily the uh, the merits of the project. So let's 
Does anybody have any comments on completeness? Is there anything missing in the in the application? Marianne. So I, I just want to state for the record, um, I have a concern about waiving requirements when it's the town itself that is the applicant and we're waiving the town requirements. Um, I'll be voting for completeness, but I think that the town as an applicant should almost be held to a higher standard than uh, private applicants. And I think we're going to have some other applicants later on this evening that may be seeking um, waivers um, from submitting things that are required. And uh, I want us to be always consistent. So um, I just want to state that for the record. I'm a little uncomfortable with um, it, but I will be voting for completeness nonetheless. I, I, I don't think we're seeking waivers on anything. We've, we've uh, followed the process. According to the town planners cover memo, um, she's got three, I think three waivers. And again, I'm, I'm okay with this. I just, we're going to have other applicants for other projects down the line looking for waivers. And I think we need to be consistent. Yeah, do you see that waiver, Mitch, about the contours? And then a waiver from a high de intensity soil survey, and then a waiver for a stormwater management plan. So again, I support no, it. No I'm going to vote for it. I'm going to vote for it. I just want to state for the record that I'm uncomfortable seeing the town coming in looking for waivers. Um, and I think we should be consistent. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Jonathan. Um, I, I definitely think Marianne has a point about being consistent. I don't want to create precedent. Um, but at the same time, given what the application is uh, with uh, making minimal changes to the boards or to the trails with um, these types of boards, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, with the waivers for uh, this type of application that's making um, or proposing these type of changes. And I think in the in the end we have a we have a terrible bit of erosion that's occurring. Um, so from a conservationist perspective, it, it really needs to be fixed. We've been we've sat on this for a couple of years, that's, waiting that's, to get permits. And Mitch, I don't think that's the point she's making. It's, a, okay. it's sort of an administrative thing. It's the level of detail of the contour lines on the plan. Right now, they show two feet and. The town requirement is one foot interval contours. That's what it is. Nothing to do with the actual trails themselves. Is that correct, Marianne? That's correct. And, you know, I want to be really clear. I'm going to support it. I'm going to vote for completeness. Just a little bit uncomfortable when it's the town itself seeking waivers from town ordinances. So, uh, but yeah, Mitch, no, um, nothing against what you've put together. And it's clear that this needs to be done. Thank you. Jim, I have a motion. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Jonathan. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted for a resource protection permit <laughs> to alter 1,100 square feet of RP1 and RP2 wetlands to install boardwalk on the existing town farm trails located at the town farm on um, Spurwink Avenue, uh, R5-11, R5-13, be deemed complete. Second. Mary, uh, Maureen, please take a vote. Who was the second? Carolyn. Thank you. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Starbeck? Yes. Chair Hubner? Yes. Uh, do I have a motion to table? Um, can, can we have a discussion before there's a motion to table? Yeah. Because my understanding is once we, there's a motion to table, we can't discuss things. Oh, so yeah, go ahead. I guess I was thinking um, it looking at the procedure that the town planner had outlined for us, that we had the option of approving, approving with conditions, tabling or denying the application. And yeah. I would 
have I would have moved to approve the application tonight um, rather than table it and have a public hearing. I, I think we have enough information. Notwithstanding my philosophical concerns about waivers. <laughs> Don't we have to have a public hearing though? Not according to the discussion of the procedure that the Maureen O'Meara put out on the first page. At the end of this discussion, the board has the option to approve, approve with conditions, table or deny the application. Yeah, I, I have to admit you're right, Mary. I don't, and I don't have a problem with going to that next step. Is anybody else? Hey, well, if we're talking about setting precedent, I don't know if we want to set a precedent of approving something without a public hearing. Well, yeah. I would, I would approve this without a public hearing. Uh, uh, Jim, this Dan, uh, uh, Maureen, a question: Have we done this before? Is um, is that condition at the end of the procedure? Is the bullet head um, that Marianne is talking about? Has that always been there, or is that just for this project? You're talking about whether or not you're required to hold a public hearing. Yes. Um, I'm I'm going to confirm that, but you're. I don't believe you're required to hold a public hearing. I believe that, like I said, I want to. It right now, okay. I know with site plans you you have an option to hold the public hearing. The subdivisions you have uh, no option. You are required to hold a public hearing. Um, I think there see. is some leeway in that. I remember reading it today while looking right. at something else. I just can't go right to it. It's uh, I found it. Carolyn, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll let Maureen finish. No. Okay. Yeah, it says. You, you are not required to hold a public hearing. Um, prior to considering the application, planning board shall refer to the conservation committee. You, that's been done within 35 days following the public hearing if one is held. All right. Very good, Marianne. Um, I would entertain a, a motion to approve the application. Say it again. Can I, can I go? Oh, yeah. I Sorry I about I have, that. I have very bad communication here. Um, there's a little conflict, though. If if Marianne has a philosophical different concern with waivers, we can't go ahead and approve this unless we include the waivers. So if oh, we, she doesn't want to include the waivers. They need some time to fix things so that well, we've already voted that the application is complete. Yeah, that doesn't mean we voted to accept the waivers. It means we've determined there's enough information to move forward. And also, and I don't have out. a problem with the waivers. A project of this size and for this purpose. I don't have an issue with the waivers. Uh, the only thing I would suggest is a, a narrative on the direction of the water flow to include that. But uh, I, so I'll go either way. I just wanted to point that out. Well, I, I would like some proposed findings of fact as well. All right, maybe we should, maybe we're, we're, instead of rushing this through, I guess we table it then. It sounds like we're all. So we have two Eagle Scouts that want to complete this project. I don't want to put undue pressure on you. Um, I, I've presented this to you twice now as a town volunteer, two Eagle Scouts. It'd be great to get this done. Well, what, I'm what prepared think, to. I'm prepared to vote to approve it tonight. If if it needs a a vote on the way on waiver language, um, I'm sure the staff can provide us with the necessary language. But I think this is a pretty de minimis project. You've got we've got all the information we need, and we ought to let the Eagle Scouts go at it. Thank you, Marianne. Daniel. Yeah, um, I don't have a problem with the waivers either. I think this project is awesome. 
I think it's great that we've got two Eagle Scouts um, that are um, going to um, you know work on this project. I would I don't know who mentioned it, but I would agree just having a little narrative about number eight about the water flow direct uh, direction. I mean that's really simple to do. I'm sure that uh, Mitch and his team could do that, but I'm ready to vote on it tonight. Well, I my only thing is I'd like to know what findings of fact we're going to vote on since nothing's been prepared for us. I mean, obviously I, I support this project 1000%, but I just, we don't have findings of fact. So I don't know if I we guess... to do those on the fly. That's when we've gotten in trouble before. I don't see this going to the lock or into the spirit court, but at the same time, I'm just a little bit wary about not being prepared on something. Help us out Maureen. What's that? Oh, um, <laughs> um, I'm good, but I, I, I can't do findings while I'm doing every other part of this meeting. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you took a, you know, a five minute or 10 minute uh, break, I could whip something up for you. Um, but other than that, uh, there's, there's no way I can do that while the meeting is running. I, I think we have too much on the agenda to take a 10 minute break. This is a pretty, pretty big agenda with a pretty big, big issue that's gonna take a lot of time. Yeah. So while I support this project and would happily have moved it forward without a properly written uh, findings of fact and, and uh, the whole thing of conditions of approval, I, I'm with Jonathan, I hesitate to do it. And I think it's great there are Eagle Scouts, and I'm sorry that um, we might have to wait till June to do this. All right, so I guess we're back to see if there's a motion to table, I guess, and then we'll we'll have the findings of fact for the next meeting. Uh, did I make a motion to approve it already? No. I guess a not. motion, okay. No, there's a... There's a motion to table on that page. Trump it. Yeah, that trumps it anyway. Well, there's there was no motion made. There, there's a motion in front of you, and you discussed a motion to, to approve. No one actually officially made a motion, at, which was then seconded. So you're still out there. And uh, with deep respect to Mitch, um, the idea of an experience expedited review was discussed by the planning board at the workshop and you know there was no decision that that's the way it was going to be and all the other times the town has come to the planning board it's asked for an expedited review and we seem to have a little bit more time this time so we figured we wouldn't we wouldn't push our luck since every other time we've asked for an expedited review that is true I have a motion to table go ahead jonathan uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted for a resource protection permit to alter 1,100 square feet of RP1 and RP2 wetlands to install boardwalk on the existing town farm trails located at the town farm on Spurwink Avenue, R5-11, R5-13, be tabled to the June 15, 2021 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Please take a vote, Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Uh, Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. Four to one. Four to one. Yep. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. Okay. The next item uh, 71 Beach Plough Terrace. Private access way amendment. Peter Weir is requesting an amendment to the previously approved private access way for the lot located at 71 Beach Bluff Terrace, U10-37. Replace the public water supply with a private well, section 19-7-9, private access way completeness and public hearing. So Peter, are you there? I am looking in now. Okay, I've got a Ryan Weir, which seems a good candidate. Let's see what happens. Is 
that you, Peter? I'm asking you to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Yes, Thank my you. son's computer. That's why Brian came up here. His name. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing this board. Um, you want me to go with, with my spiel here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I just want to um, um, go over the um, information I had uh, sent you guys. Um, and, and address, I guess, the, qual the quantity and quality of the water from the well. Of course, you know, any well you drill, you're not going to know what you're going to come up with. But uh, most cases, the water is uh, good. Anyway, um, there's 83 recorded wells in Cape um, that, that are drilled. The last one that went in was uh, 331 of this year in, in, on Ram Island Road. Um, and um, on the list that I gave you, the, say the, the, the last 12 wells, they average from depth from 100 feet to uh, 440, and the water was from one gallon to 85 gallons per minute, is, is how much they varied over that amount of, uh, of wells. Um, out of, out of the, uh, I, I personally have put in 18 wells uh, in, my, build, in building houses, and everyone has passed as far as uh, quantity and quality. Um, some did have to have filters. Most of them didn't. Um, if I just that's what happens when you do a well. You don't know. You really don't till you till you uh, drill down. Um, and as far as the quality, I just put in a little statement from um, Maine.gov, um, noting that that well water is safe. Um, and they do recommend testing with that, which, which is what we do test the water um, after we drill down there. Um, and, and as far as, as, as the site goes, um, so that was, the, that was the water in the well. As far as the site goes, there is a um, um, septic bed revision that was uh, sent in uh, the other day. And it pushes it 15 feet further away from the well. Um, we went, we went with that initially was for the, for the house building site, but um, in talking to the um, soil engineer, he agreed uh, and thought this was a better uh, system to put in there. And, and that's what I'm gonna go with. Um, so that doesn't show on the plan you submitted? It doesn't show on the plan. It's, there's a separate septic plan that shows it on, on uh, okay. that I submitted, yeah. Anything else, Peter? Uh, no, that, that's it. Okay. I'll uh, now open the meeting to public comment on completeness. Uh, does anybody from the public, if you have any comments on this, please use the raise hand feature. I don't see any raised hands, Jim. Okay. Going once, going twice, the public comment period is closed. Uh, planning board, does anybody have any comments on completeness? I do not have a comment on completeness, no. Okay. Um, do I have a motion on completeness then? I, I'll read it if you guys can hear me with this. Yeah, foolish yeah you're much, it's much better now than it was when you started, Carol Ann. Uh, I'm using this foolish little tablet instead of my regular computer. Um, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Ware for an amendment to the previously approved private access way for 71 Beach Bluff Terrace to replace the public water supply with a private well be deemed complete. Second. Please take a vote, uh, Maureen. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Ms. Uh, Chair Hubner? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 
Um, so let me see here. I would make a motion for approval. Do we want to have a site, uh, any discussion oh. at all before we have a motion for? Oh, for do we need public comment on? We uh, already closed that. No, that was on completeness. Oh. Gee. We, um, yeah, we, we need to determine if a site walk and pub and or public hearing be scheduled. Does anybody want a site walk? For this i've no. been i've no. been there before and i do not okay so no site walk and um we just had a public hearing completeness i'll open it again to see if anybody from the public wants to speak on the merits of the project seeing none i assume Marie. there's no hands raised going once going twice the public comment is closed um do i have a motion on approval uh, can I, I have a question before the motion okay uh number th finding of fact number three in the motion talks about public sewer system yeah this is this is on a this is going to be using a septic disposal system not the uh, public sewer yeah. And that was approved that way originally. That's not a change. That's part of the original approval of this project. Yeah, so we're That's an error. Okay. Uh, we can out. strike it. Yes. Okay. Dan, can... you, Dan, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, right, Jim. Um, just looking at Sebago Technics letter. Uh, and I don't know if the applicant's going to do this, but they're he he, he Kind of hand drawn in where the well's going to go, and Sebago is recommending that be, um, you know, shown um, in CAD or something like that. Just, just a comment. Um, and then um, also uh, just a, a note, and I, I agree with this. Added to the plan on which describes the purpose of the current amendment, and I don't know if that's on this current drawing we're looking at. Um, and, I, no. and, and then second of, I guess the, the, uh, the third or a question, will the, will the plan go, you know, before the, um, the uh, inspectional services? Maureen. Okay, so um, this plan that you have in front of you is the original approved plan and, okay. and the applicant has just drawn something in. So the title block has not been updated. The infrastructure that shows the public water connection is all still here. Yeah. And the town engineer is asking that um, the applicant be required to have his designer update this plan to reflect the planning board approval. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So is he going to do that? If you require it, then it's supposed to be done. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's a condition. So, in, um, oh, go ahead. It's a condition of approval on, on the, the proposed motion. Well, if there is a motion, there is a condition of approval yes. to update the drawings. Yes. So it looks like we're going to get we'll get rid of item number three under pr the proposed motion for approval. Everything else should be okay. Do I have a do I have a motion for approval? Marianne was going to oh. go. I I yeah I was going to mo, mo I was going to make a motion. Go ahead. To approve the application. Now, do I have to? Uh, I'm a new member. Do I have to read all these findings of fact, or yes, can I? Okay. Yeah. Have so at it. I'll, I'll, I'll let someone else make the motion. Okay. Findings of fact. <laughs> can blame all the lawyers for that, Marianne. <laughs> Peter Weir. Findings of fact number one. Peter Weir is requesting an amendment to the private access way granted for the lot located at 71. Beach Bluff Terrace to replace a public water service with a private well, which requires review for compliance with section 19-7-9 private access way. Number two, a private access way permit for 71 Beach Bluff Terrace has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the zoning ordinance section 19-7 dash nine and the findings and decisions of those approvals 
which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number three, a building envelope is, correct me Maureen if I'm wrong, correct. is correct. depicted wherein the house and the accessory buildings will be located on the lot demonstrating conformance with the setback requirements of the district in which it is located and any natural constraints and that the house site will be buffered from abutting residential properties. Number four, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways and section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Weir for an amendment to the previously approved private access way for 71 Beach Bluff Terrace to replace the public water supply with a private well will be approved subject to the following conditions. That the number one, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated May 10, 2021. And do we need the sec the last finding? Yes. With yes. respect to, okay, that there is no issuance of a subsurface wastewater disposal permit until the plans have been re revised to satisfy the above condition and submitted to the town planner. Second. That's my motion. Please take a vote, Maureen. Sure. Uh, Mr. Budensky? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Huebner? Yes. The motion passes five to nothing. Thank you. Maureen, just to let you know, I am here. Yeah, I noticed. How you doing? Hi, good. I'm going to abstain from that. Okay. All right. Welcome. Oh, Welcome. I'm sorry. I didn't even mention your name. I saw you and I didn't. My apologies. That's no problem. That happens. Apparently That's with every item. Sometimes I like to go unnoticed. <laughs> All right, next item in the agenda, 287 Ocean House Road Site Plan Amendment. Michael Friedland, Friedland is requesting amendments to the previously approved site plan for 287 Ocean House Road to delete the finished paving coat, revive the outdoor storage, and expand the outdoor display hours Section 19-9 site plan completeness. Do we have uh, somebody from uh, to present the project? We do. Let me let me get them uh, on board, and also hopefully they'll be willing to host their plans. Hey Dan, just to let you know your raised hand is. Feature is up. So Brandon, are you there? Yes. There we go. Okay, Brandon, take it away. So Brandon, do you want to be host for your plans? Uh, if you could just pull up the site plan, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Maureen. Hi, my name is Brendan Bennett. I'm here with uh, Northeast Civil Solutions on behalf of Yam Yam LLC. Uh, also here with me is Jamie Wagner, which is the attorney uh, for Yam Yam LLC and also the owner, Michael Freeland. So if we have any questions at the end, uh, we'll be able to ask him. Uh, so the parcel in question is located on tax map U22, lot 76. It's within the town center district. This is also known as 287 Ocean House Road. Uh, as you may remember, uh, this was a previously approved job and we've kind of come back to make a couple amendments. Uh, we've simplified it from the last time that we were here. Um, 
And the first thing I really want to point out is right at the north side of the building, kind of the northwest side as well, um, we've added an eight foot stockade fence. Uh, this is going to be used for kind of lumber storage as Mr. Freeland found out while he was ordering stuff that the previous concrete pad, as you can see there, um, he's going to keep there was not sufficient for his needs. Um, so instead we uh, kind of cornered off a uh, part of the building uh, that will be gated, eight foot, eight foot high stockade fence, which will be closed obviously during uh, closing times, open for the public uh, for anything else that they need during that time. Um, this did eliminate a few parking spots. I do want to point out though that we are still uh, meeting the required parking spots by double, uh, which is 16. The required is eight, um, which is 15 plus one for the handicapped parking spot. So even though that we did eliminate some, we still do meet that requirement. Um, I'd also like to point out in the back of the lot, there is another stockade fence. It's about 10 feet long. Um, this is, <clears throat> this is at, right next to the handicapped parking spot. Um, you'll see right at the corner of the building. This is just to kind of shield anything that is out back, uh, any kind of ladders or anything else that really isn't for the public to uh, really see or, or look into. Um, this is just to make it more aesthetically pleasing and also kind of sections off the back of the building uh, more for security purposes out of anything uh, as well as shielding. Um, Next, I do want to point out that I did move the bike rack. Uh, it's kind of to the front near, uh, right next to kind of the grass area. It's inside the building envelope. It was in the storage area proposed. Um, we didn't really want to get rid of that. We wanted to keep that. So we just moved it out there. Um, so that should solve any problems with that. So we didn't actually eliminate it. Um, next, I want to talk about is the storage area out front of the building. So Currently, the approval allows for storage outside during business hours. This is included like mulch, sand, seasonal things. It's all underneath the roof. Um, I'd like to kind of point out in the packet that the photos that I've attached will help kind of aid in what I'm talking about. Um, you can kind of see Mike put some up during business hours, took a photo, so you'll kind of see uh, how good of a job he did. It looks really, really good. Um, but he would like to keep that as kind of 24 hours there all the time. He doesn't want to lug them in and out the whole entire, uh, every time they open and close. Um, the bulk of the material will be inside the storage area. This is just kind of for more of display. A couple bags here and there, you'll see he also has some plants, that kind of stuff, you know, seasonal stuff that will go out there, shovels, anything. It's some small stuff like that. Um, also on the curved area, there's kind of a triangle uh, outdoor storage area that I've pointed out. Um, this is on the curb. Uh, it will be used for potted plants. He'd like to keep that there for 24 hours, you know, all day, every day kind of thing. He doesn't want to move them in and out. Uh, he wants it outside of the coverage simply because that's plants. They need some kind of sun and also rain. Uh, and it will still have the ADA compliant walkway, as you can see between the building. So that won't come into any kind of uh, ADA issues. So that should hopefully solve that. Um, lastly, uh, he would like to get rid of the 1.25 course wear coat. Uh, he had the parking lot paved and we felt that it wasn't strictly needed uh, simply because this was a gravel lot before he is making it better. Um, we just put that on there as part of our detail and it's holding up great. I know the town engineer was worried about the lifespan of it. Um, I know talking with Mike that he was more than willing to make sure that the pavement was in good working order at all times. Um, will this potentially bring down the lifespan of the pavement? Yes, but uh, regular traffic going in and out of there, um, it's gonna hold up pretty well. And I, we're not concerned regarding this. Um, if anything does come up, uh, he'll keep it in safe working order. So it's really on him to repair anything if this does break down prematurely, um, which we don't expect it to by any means. Um, we do want to point out that the estimates on these are about twenty-four dollars to $25,000. I did attach two of them. Um, they did point it out at 1.5 inches. This is kind of typical as when they 
put rollers over it, it does squish out to about inch and a quarter. This is really to cover the pavers uh, and make sure that they're meeting what they are uh, producing. Um, we do have additional estimates in that that keep coming back all around the same uh, estimates. So it's not just two pavers. He did call around and quite a few do have uh, their kind of estimates and it's all around the same, uh, unfortunately, which is exponentially high. Um, in that regard, I would like to hopefully hand it over to Jamie Wagner. If Maureen, you could please bring him in. He's the attorney. Uh, he can also kind of expand on this pavement issue for me um, regarding the ordinance. Uh, so Maureen, if you could please bring him in, that'd be great. Me? Yeah, we got you, Jamie. Go ahead. All right. Thanks, everyone. Greetings to my friends and neighbors on the board. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jamie Wagner. I'm an attorney who practices here and lives here in Cape Elizabeth. Happen to practice right here in the town center where I'm sitting right now. Um, I also happen to have the good fortune to own and operate a business in the town center for eight years. Uh, formerly known as the local bus. Um, about Mike Friedland and the lumbery, I, I'd like to say initially that I appreciate an entrepreneur's spirit and efforts that brings new ideas to our wonderful town. And I know that all of you appreciate that as well. I'm only gonna speak to the issue of the, um, of the site plan uh, request to remove the top coat or the surface court, uh, course of the pavement from the site plan. We'd ask that you would approve that removal. There's uh, three reasons in summary there are one, it's very expensive proposition to the applicant. Two, it's not necessary. And three, that there's nothing in the town's ordinance that requires it. Uh, so the first query is whether or not the planning board should be concerned with the expense of the, the top coat. I think the expense should be a factor that the planning board considers when you have a reasonable request that's compliant with ordinance. I also think that the spirit and the letter of the Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan should be our guide for the big picture um, aspect of this request. Um, specifically on the comprehensive plan, I would direct your attention to page 37, where they were discussing the public opinion survey of the town residents. They said 60% of the residents strongly or moderately support new commercial development. Um, there was less support for establishing new commercial zones suggesting that the residents would like more development to be located in the existing commercial zones, i.e. the town center. On page 44, a goal number two was that the town center shall be promoted as the primary commercial area of Cape Elizabeth. And one of the recommendations in that regard was, quote, develop strategies to start and promote small businesses in the town center to serve the residents. I would ask you to recognize that the applicant owns a small business. He's incurred very significant startup costs. He has to pay staff expenses, ongoing expenses, and has a family to support. I'd appreciate if you consider this factor when you're making your decision. He's not asking you to ignore ordinance. He'll fully comply with ordinance. He's just requesting not to be economically burdened with a line item that's not required or necessary to put forward his plan. So regarding the ordinance, um, the top coat isn't required by ordinance. Neither the town engineer nor the code enforcement officer has said that Cape ordinance requires the top coat. I communicated with Ben McDougall and he directed me to the appropriate ordinance sections, which I've reviewed and I heard you to review too if you have not yet. Um, starting at page 270 of the zoning ordinance, section nine, 19-9-5 discusses the approval standards. And this section discusses the criteria to be used by the planning board in reviewing site plans. Significantly, it states on page 271 that quote, the application shall, shall be approved unless the planning board determines that the applicant has failed to meet one or more of these standards. We'd submit that the applicant has met the standards and therefore the planning board sh should and shall approve it. 
page 272, which Ben also directed me to, under section 2.B. Roman numeral 6, titled Construction, it states, quote, road, driveway, and parking lot construction comply with the construction and design standards in 16-3-2 of the subdivision ordinance. So I turned to sec section 16-3-2 of the subdivision ordinance on page 25. The ordinance notably mentions that the standards are to, quote, be consistent with the comprehensive plan directing us back to the comprehensive plan that we already discussed. It also states that, quote, standards shall be flexible where an applicant can demonstrate that alternative approaches will meet the above stated purposes. We would submit that he has done so. On page 31, there is in number four, the paving section, and they have a paving chart that discusses a variety of different types of roadways and sidewalks but it does not mention parking lots. 4D discusses driveways and states that a paved apron should extend four feet toward the property being served. But that is the only applicant that may apply here. I mean, that's the only requirement that may apply here. Uh, when uh, many years ago, when I was in law school, more recent for Jonathan, but it's been 30 years for me, uh, we learned a Latin maxim that was expressio unius est exclusio alterius, which is a, a principle of statutory construction. That means that when one or, one or more things of a class are expressly mentioned, that the others of the same class are excluded. So in this case, that would mean because parking lots are not specifically mentioned, they're not to be treated as uh, roadways or sidewalks. Uh, in that regard, so I, I, to, to wrap it up, I, I think that the, the ordinance shows that there's no requirement that he need add the one and a quarter inch top coat. I had a discussion with the town engineer yesterday with Stephen Harding to discuss his letter dated May 10th, 2021. Regarding the top coat issue, Stephen agreed that he essentially had three comments about the top coat. One, he was concerned there would be less resistance to damage and durability issues. Two, diminished lifespan. And three, if the lot was not maintained, that safety could be lessened. And I'm not disagreeing with Stephen's analysis per se, but I said to Stephen, isn't that an owner's issue? If he paves his parking lot such that it's a little less durable and has less of a lifespan, is that something that an owner would have to deal with or is that something the town has to deal with? Isn't that an economic decision for the owner? Stephen didn't disagree with me. He understood my point. He didn't take a position on whether that's a town issue or the property owner's issue. I would submit that this is a property owner's issue and not the town's. So as a lawyer, I happen to love analogies. So I'd ask you to bear with me just for a couple. If I buy a new iPhone and I'm deciding whether to buy one of those clunky otter boxes to put on it or to use the one that my 13 year old daughter has, it's much less clunky. Um, that's a phone owner taking a risk of regarding damage and durability. If I buy a new car and they offer to put an expensive rust coat application on my underbelly, that's up to me as the owner to decide if I'd rather spend the money now or later. So if you want to spend the extra dollars to ostensibly protect your investment, you can do it. But if you don't want to spend money on the front end and you're willing to make the uh, whatever necessary maintenance or repairs later, then so be it. It should be up to the owner. I say this to my legal clients all the time. Do you want me to put together a filing that's a Mercedes or are you okay with a Honda? They both get you where you want to go, do the job just fine. Depends on how much you want to spend. So to wrap this up, I reiterate that this is a decision that has real economic consequences for the applicant. One that could have a serious financial impact on his business. And the comprehensive plan tells us we should promote small businesses and that we shouldn't burden a small business if the ordinance doesn't require it. I want to thank all of you members of the board for your volunteer service. I know that it takes a lot of hours 
and I appreciate your reasoned examination of this applicant's request. I really appreciate your time that you're spending on this project. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie. Anybody else from uh, your team have anything to say? That's it for me. Okay. Um, next, I'm gonna open up the meeting for public comment. And this is public comment on completeness, not whether you think it's a good idea about keeping or eliminating the top coat. This is about, do we have the information to then discuss the project? So if any member of the public are, uh, I mean, we've received several emails on, you think it's a good idea to eliminate the top coat. That's not what this public comment is about. It's about, do we have the information? So with that being said, do we have any member of the public wishing to speak on completeness? Maureen, see anybody? I'm seeing no hands. Okay. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Going once, going twice. Uh, the public comment period on completeness is closed. Um, next, I'd like to open it up to the board to discuss completeness issues. Does anybody have any comments? answer to the potentially incomplete items on page two of our packet. The existing conditions and the financial capability are, are pointed out as potentially incomplete. Have we received additional information that makes them complete? Maureen? Nothing has been received since the original submission. So I, I guess, Marty, explain to me, I, I got, I, I see the pictures of the original plans. It looks like they're actually three drawings in the original site plan. And now we have two. And I don't see you, you have that picture on our sheet here with all those, is it 10 comments? There, yeah. So when an applicant uh, applies for an amendment to a previous approval, we ask them to provide information that's related to the proposed amendment. So for example, if you had a, a five sheet package and one of them was the standard boundary survey and you weren't proposing to change the boundaries, you wouldn't need to submit that page. Um, unfortunately, the, the applicant did not submit the approved plan. And it's kind of hard for the board to determine if you're willing to amend a plan if you don't have the approved plan in front of you. And so is it significant what the differences are? Well, unfortunately, the, uh, the final approved plan included the notes regarding what was allowed for outdoor storage, which is directly related to one of the site plan amendments requested by the applicant. So uh, the, the real challenge here for the board is if there are multiple site plans floating around a project, it makes it uh, the, the likelihood that any part of those site plans is going to be enforced is very, very low. Okay. It may seem like a, a picky thing, but the lawyers, as Jonathan Sarbeck said, the lawyers have spoken. And if we don't dot all the I's and cross the T's, as Jamie, you can, uh, you can respect, then we leave the town open for potential legal action. So um, I guess, is it, does Michael or anybody have any comments on, on, on an updated site plan? I, uh, Jim, I just want to point out, I, I believe planning board member Lynch has had her hand raised. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, I'm sorry, Marianne. Yeah, that's okay. I, I guess I'm fine with li listening to the applicant and allowing the applicant time to respond to it. I guess I had a question. Um, the planner has taken a picture of the original approved site plan, including note eight. And um, I was satisfied that we had enough information before us um, for me to vote that this application is complete. 
and then to discuss the substance of it. Uh, I'm a lawyer also. I guess I tend not to be as picky as perhaps some other lawyers. Um, and I, I did think that the picture that uh, Maureen O'Meara took satisfied perhaps what we were concerned was missing. Uh, uh, Jim, You're Jim Lange, I, I'd just like to say this. Um, I think I think what it, to me what this does is put, put uh, the people working for Mike on notice that this is information we need. If we determine this is complete tonight and we come when we come back to really look at the plan and vote on the plan, we want to have all of that information that is indicated as questionable. Um, and so it's to beef up your submission a little bit here. And, uh, and I, can, I can accept that it's coming later as long as I hear the words from the engineer who's doing these plans that it's coming later. Brandon, do we have those words? Yeah, sure. Uh, we were, yeah, we're really asking for the same amount of stuff to, uh, you know, everything to be out there just a different time. Uh, try not to clutter up the plans by any means, but we have no problem. I have no problem adding that on there and saying the revision on the approved plans. We can definitely uh, shoot that over to you later. That's not an issue at all. Um, so I would want to be part of the final submission package. Can I, can I just ask why they weren't brought in on this package, or this application? Brandon? Uh, simply not to clutter up everything. Um, we figured that could always be uh, worded out later uh, regarding that. Um, I do apologize for not including that the first time, uh, as that would have probably made it a lot easier calling out the specific page note and everything else uh, and the wording that would really be changed that we're showing that it's for uh, outdoor storage kind of all the time, not just for business hours. I'm okay. willing, willing to work with Maureen uh, to get that done uh, and make sure that anybody that is on the board as well as Maureen is uh, happy with that afterwards. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, you still have your hand up. You have more to say? I just had one question uh, with regards to something that um, Jamie said. Uh, Jamie, you, good to see you by the way. Um, you had mentioned something along the lines of that a top coat wouldn't be necessary because there's an alternative in place or Mike's done things that would make it unnecessary. Make it unnecessary in your view. What are those things that Mike's done with regards to not needing a uh, a, a top coat of the pavement? I think that I would like to have that information um, in terms of completeness. Um, and so I'm hoping you can provide some information on that. Yeah, I think that the status quo right now, Jonathan, is that there was a base course of you know as required um, as as the engineer planned for um, of, I think Brandon can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 18 inches. And then the initial pavement um, course, uh, which we would say is the alternative, right? It's, it's adequate. It didn't even have, under the ordinance, it was our position that it doesn't even have to be paved. Um, that only the possibly up to the apron of the parking lot would need to be paved. It's paved, it, it carries the trucks and cars just fine. Um, if there's any maintenance issues, it will be addressed um, at the time that it is required. Any road, whether or not you have the top course on it or not, or any parking lot is eventually gonna need maintenance. Um, so we'll, we'll address that at the time that it becomes necessary, but he'd rather not spend that 25 to $26,000 at this point um, because he's just getting his business going. Uh, but he certainly would take care of that at a later point if it ever became a maintenance problem. Okay, because when you weren't part of this original approval, um, you weren't part of his team at that time, but when this came up for the original approval, he never said anything about only doing one coat and kind of going beyond what is basically what's done with commercial property. And I appreciate your analogy about owners and maintenance and stuff like that. I think the little difference in the deviation from that 
is that this is a car that's being used for public or for a public commodity because public is accessing this site for commercial use. It's not a private ownership. So I think it's a little bit different um, when you say that this is up to the owner and the owner can do what he wants to do with his own property. So I'm just, let me just get this straight though. There's nothing that's been done since the original approval that he's taken steps. He's used different pavement. He used something that deviates from why a top coat wouldn't be necessary. I just no, want to- there's not, not, nothing, nothing in addition. Okay, thanks. Uh, Maureen, how does this set a precedence if we skip this, if we approve, or not, obviously not today, but if we decide this is complete and we ultimately uh, do not require this top code, what kind of precedent does that set? Well, I think there isn't a business person out there who isn't gonna be concerned with how much they have to invest in their property. And when some property owners are making this investment, and then others are not, some of them have a, an advantage, a competitive advantage. So um, my expectation is that um, unless you're going to get more people who are going to be asking for this, unless they are taking the advice of their professionals that are telling them that you are, you're drastically damaging the lifespan of the pavement by not putting on the top coat. So if you grant it now, and, and especially if you grant it because of financial reasons, that's gonna become very much a reason for other things to be requested. Okay, Marianne, thank you, Maureen. Um, sure. Yeah. I'm not sure quite where we are because I thought we were just discussing the uh, completeness, uh, but I'm we see- kind of Deviating, I guess, go ahead, Marianne. Yeah, we seem to have slipped into the substance and I just yeah. wanted to, state for the record, I spent more time on this than I hate to admit as I was looking like Jamie Wagner for parking, but I did find in the site plan review um, parking and it's in 19-7-8, all parking areas shall be designed to adequately control drainage in furtherance of this standard drainage calculations used shall reflect a paved condition and all parking areas shall be constructed with base material which can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. So I agree with Jamie Wagner on the fact that in the subdivision ordinance, there is no mention of parking. And we have all of the other um, roads mentioned, but there is specifically a mention in the site plan on parking. And so I would be expecting that what, we're, what, would, what we would be seeing is some information on whether the existing base material can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. Okay. Uh, I guess, Dan, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak and then I'm gonna get back to completeness so we can be focused on this. And we did that. Yeah, you know, you know Jim, my, um, my comment has to do with substance. So shall I just hold off on that? Yeah, would you please? I will, I will. Okay. What's the latest? The other uh, potentially incomplete item is financial capability. What's the latest on that? Maureen? Yes. Oh, yes. So, well, whenever you bring something back to the board, uh, like I said, even though the applicant did not submit the approved plan, uh, I gave them credit for everything that they had demonstrated in the past. And then the only things we look at are things that have changed because of the proposed amendment. And it's up to the board to decide if you want to look at financial capability again, since the applicant is saying they need this amendment because they can't afford to put this work into it. This was just to be clear, uh, when, when you submit financial capability to get your original approval, you're promising that you can afford to build the project that has been submitted to the board and approved by the board. And the applicant's own admission is kind of suggesting maybe this needs a second look. 
Thank you, Maureen. Marianne, you have another comment? Or is your hand still oh, up? Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to lower my hand. Any other comments on completeness? Jonathan. I, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but there was a few months ago, or actually it was probably maybe a year ago, I feel like it was last summer, when I actually think it was a Beach Bluff Terrace application came in and it did not have the adequate site plans um, that were submitted and we voted it incomplete because it didn't have the materials that we needed. Um, does anybody else recall that correctly? Or maybe Maureen, maybe your memory is better than mine. Um, um, I think I, it might be more than a year ago, but I, okay. I think you're correct. And I mean, the board- well, Actually, yeah, I think we were, in the, we were in the town hall at that time. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I remember, I remember it's because it's unusual not to approve completeness. Uh, but I think there was a significant, there was significant number of things that were missing. Not, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just trying to be consistent. So thank you, Caroline. I appreciate that. Brandon, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, uh, I did kind of want to speak to, I guess, uh, that existing condition, no eight. Uh, it was previously kind of, uh, uh, it's a site plan amendment. So uh, I was kind of working off of the old one um, for the financial capacity. Um, obviously, if the top coat is not approved um, that I'm sorry, if it is approved that he doesn't have to do it, uh, that would substantially help him out uh, regarding the financial capacity and be able to uh, complete the job uh, for sure. Uh, no, no talking with Michael Freeland. I know he said he, uh, he, he could definitely cover it, but it's uh, kind of a pretty big burden uh, regarding that. The old uh, approval does say that he has to apply the top coat, and if he must, he must. Um, but regarding financial capacity, you should be able to take care of that, especially since the last time uh, that, that was kind of uh, part of the approval. Um, and I think I'll uh, hand it back over to you. Hey, Jonathan, your hand's still up, or you? Oh, okay. Any Sorry other, about that. Any other comments on completeness? Seeing none, do I have a motion on completeness? Can I, can I add a caveat to the motion? <laughs> Go ahead. Wait a minute, let me find the motion. Um, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented and the facts presented would be that this information we're talking about will be provided. Um, the application of Yum Yum LLC for amendments to the site plan approved for 287 Ocean House Road B to alter outdoor storage and eliminate a finished coat be deemed complete. Second. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Maureen, please take the roll. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. The motion is unanimous. Um, any other further discussion on, uh, or do we have any further discussion or do we want a, a motion to the table? I have a question. Uh, well, and oh, Dan had a question, so I'll wait. I'll pull my uh, question. Yeah. So well, I, 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 I've got just a, 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 I guess, a question to the applicant. Um, our town engineer talked about uh, looking at his letter. He talked about ninety dollars per ton, and I think, if I remember correctly, the cost estimates came in as lump sum. I, I might be mistaken. Is there any way that we could find out what the dollars per tons? Per ton uh, was used for those two estimates, and I think I think your engineer said there might be a third or fourth estimate coming. And then I and I think uh, someone on the board mentioned um, having the engineer or someone on your side do a calculation or show us that that existing parking lot can handle you know those intended truckloads because you've got some heavy vehicles there dropping off lumber and you know some other items. You might even have a forklift. Those are heavy. Those are pretty significant wheel loads. I would love to see some type of, uh, you know, with, with these revised plans, some type of an analysis or something like that. So that's my comment. 
Is that Brandon is something that's possible to provide? Um, so first I'll kind of uh, take on the estimate question. Um, I am not entirely sure how these pavers estimated per ton the job. Uh, obviously we thought the first two were substantially high. <laughs> um, we went to other pavers, they got back to us slowly. I think we have two other ones and they're all coming in at, the, at a very similar ballpark and figure about 24 to $25,000. Um, so I'm assuming it's just the market that's going on right now uh, that it's just extremely expensive to build um, with all the prices going up. That being the case, I could definitely call the estimators and figure out what they're really using per ton. Um, the only thing I will say to that is if I have four estimates saying it's all about, you know, the same price, uh, I'm not sure that's really going to help us uh, regarding that. I can definitely break it down for you if that's something you guys so choose. I have no problem at all doing that. Uh, but it's not just two pavers. I want to kind of make that clear. I know Jamie as well has, uh, has just received them uh, not, not, not long ago at all. So we are dealing with that. So I can say pretty, pretty confidently it's, it's going to be about $24,000 to $25,000. Um, okay. To do I haven't done enough estimating. You know, if you've got a tight group, and then it is what it is. Yeah, I, I don't make the prices. <laughs> uh, so I'm just, uh, I'm really relaying the information of what other pavers are willing to do the job for. Um, and there's nothing I can do to change that, uh, except provide you with more and provide you with what they're doing per ton. I'm not sure where Steve gets his numbers from. Maybe they were old, maybe they were a couple years ago. I'm not sure if the pandemic has really changed that. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. I've seen lumber go up, you know, doubled and tripled in price. So potentially this is the case as well. Uh, I don't work with paving every single day and estimating. Um, regarding the truckloads, I know that I have seen uh, some kind of lumber and I do drive a work truck out there over this, I think it's 18, 15 inches. Um, I know that 15 inch kind of gravel sub base is where most of the structure actually comes in. And then we have a three inch Kind of, kind of coarse gravel base that's going to also help with that uh, from any kind of heavy loads going across. I know I was out there, oh, had to be about a month ago, and I didn't actually see any premature kind of breakdown. Uh, the wear coat is really the, I guess it's like wearing down tread on a tire. It's still going to hold if it's sitting there. Uh, just over time, it's going to wear out a little bit faster. Uh, I'm not worried about any kind of heavy loads going across it because I know that underneath that this has been a, uh, you know, gas station site. They had semis all over this thing before. So that gravel underneath is really, really sturdy. You know, you have those big tanker trucks uh, rolling across it. So that isn't an issue at all. Um, I'm not 100% sure how we could figure out what the weight it could hold just by a little minuscule difference of an inch and a quarter uh, because that core and that particular base wear coat is really just to, you know, it's kind of just a little bit layer over the top, just a little extra protection, uh, not really made for the extreme weight um, as the structural component in uh, on the pavement. Um, I could definitely try and look into that and see if I could come up with uh, what that particular smooth coat would hold uh, compared to the rest of it. Uh, I have no problem doing that. Um, I can definitely uh, make sure as part of the condition of approval that it would be sufficient for any kind of uh, truck going across it. Um, your standard forklift is probably going to be about the same weight as, you know, uh, the company truck I rolled across it the other day. And I didn't definitely didn't have any issues with that. Um, as well as, like I just said, there's there's been other trucks across this whole entire site and we just kind of went over it again, kind of did a facelift, uh, so to speak, and made sure it's uh, compact and everything's done correctly. Okay, I do note that, uh, thank you, Brandon. I do note that in the information provided to us, the DO, uh, main DOT specs 401 and 403 uh, sidewalks, and I think right now the initial course is what, two and a half inches and we're essentially, the the whole lot is paved as a sidewalk and you know not knowing anything else it seems like that would be inadequate to have cars driven over it 
But uh, anyway, I see several hands up. I'll, uh, Andrew, you haven't had a chance to speak tonight. You're up. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, I just want to say I can appreciate sort of the financial aspects of small business. I work with a small or a small business and it's always a struggle. We're soft funded. But, uh, you know, and speaking of that, I wonder, this is a question for me, Maureen. Is, is there a time frame over which this needs to occur? I'm sort of wondering, like, we know based on construction costs these days that, that, that pretty much everything across the board is actually really, really high. And, and I'm wondering if sort of an intermediate to this would be if there's a, a standard over which we want to see these things completed, say it's a year normally, and I can't remember this, but we could actually just lengthen it to two years to, to maybe see costs come down and, and then also allow business to occur for another year outside of the pandemic to kind of increase in revenue. I don't know if that's a middle ground that would would help this case or not. I'm just trying to see if there's there's even anything there and what the sort of time frame we normally work under. So the current status is that the applicant is operating the site under a temporary certificate of occupancy and the temporary certificate of occupancy is good for six months. And I believe it was issued November 12th. So um, it's, uh, it's pending this amendment. Um, you are supposed to develop your site in accordance with the approved plan before operating it. Um, there are some outstanding items that really do need to be addressed as soon as possible. Um, if you were to make it a condition that you could add the second coat at a later date, unless you, unless you required the applicant to set aside money to pay for that, the ability to enforce that's pretty much not gone. Okay. And if they have to set aside money for performance guarantee, it's kind of the equivalent of doing it now. And that makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. Jamie, you got your hand up. Thanks. I, I just want to address uh, the question about the tonnage uh, for pavement. I did talk to Stephen Harding about that, um, the price of paving. And um, he told me that it was, it just seemed to him like it was pricey. This wasn't something that he did a deep dive into and did any sort of independent analysis vis-a-vis -vis the cost just seemed pricey to him. Uh, and I suggested that probably the five cost estimates that Mike Friedland now has might be a better uh, source of data on what the actual cost would be uh, than the historical knowledge he had about it. And he didn't disagree with that. He just felt it seemed like a lot of money. And we agree that's a lot of money. I think that's part of what Andrew was talking about. Construction costs are really expensive right now. Might, there might be an inflated market that we're dealing with but um, that it is what it is. We, we have five quotes in the same area now. Okay, Carolyn, thank you, Jamie. Carolyn, you have your hand up. I have a question that's not related to paving. Mine's related to the display and they show, they're showing pictures of, of the display of flowers and mulch and such. Uh, and they mark out this triangular area where they want to add potted plants. What's going to be there in the winter and the fall and the summer when we're not doing potted plants and just, and, and all we need is a narrative. I just need to know what the plan is for what's going to be on this display 24 hours a day outside of flower season because flowers always look pretty. Brandon? Yeah, I'll just say that that, that area would just be for uh, flowers when they're in season. Um, besides that, everything else that he wants to display, you know, like a shovel or uh, a bag or two of salt will be underneath that front area where it's covered. Um, nothing else is intended for that kind of outdoor storage triangle area. The narrative should include that explicit statement. Absolutely. We can put that as a note. Uh, as what will be revised as that 
area or storage triangle area will only be for uh, flowers when in season, uh, potted flowers, that kind of thing. Yes, thank you. Jonathan. Well, my question is, what's the bit of a note? You're not gonna abide by the note because that's where we are right now. Um, when this was presented that anything wanted to be put outside, it was presented as seasonal shovels that are gonna be taken inside. That hasn't happened. They're not taking anything inside at night, which is again against, it goes against what the note said, what was explicitly promised to us and to us back when this approval was made. And it seems like this whole project is better to ask for forgiveness and ask for permission. And it's just going about whatever it wants to do. And um, it's deviated from the original plan at least three times. Um, and so I'm, I'm missing why we should sort of throw caution into the wind here and along with what's being asked for here when the applicant hasn't gone with what's been approved and really offering no other reason besides it would hurt financially for me. Um, so with that said, though, I want some information from an engineer that's going to say that this is safe for the public. I know it might have wear and tear, but our town engineer is saying it's unsafe for the paving to not be completed. Um, and that's what's being asked for here. I'd also think that we should probably get some legal advice from our town attorney on what happens if we basically prove something that's substandard for a public business in town and whether or not the is going to be liable for allowing that approval in case somebody gets hurt. Um, yes, the, the owner is going to be liable for it and probably has insurance for it. At the same time, though, do we open up the town to liability if we basically deviate from what the ordinance says and what the standards are and what has been the precedent for this board for decades? Um, I think that that's something that we have to bring up if we're going to say, you know what, for this one applicant here, because there's a financial burden that goes along with the initial approval that we gave him that he said he was going to do, that we should deviate from what our, what the ordinance is that the town council has put forward on. So I think that that's something that we need to consider, get some information on from the town attorney if we are going to go down this route of saying it's okay to not um, approve these standards. And unfortunately, as Andrew pointed out, yeah, costs of construction are going up. Paving goes up when gas prices go up. Um, that's what happens with these types of situations. So um, I, that's that's all I got to say on that. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Marianne. Okay. Um, thanks. I wanted to respond or react to a couple of things. First of all, um, as far as the um, price um, goes, I think that we should be accepting at face value the two bids that the applicant has put into their um, application. I, I don't think that it's enough for the town engineer um, or the public works director to just say, I think it's too much. The applicant has gone out and he's gotten two bids. There are bids from people who are in the business and um, I, I'm prepared to accept those bids at face value. Um, and we all know that the cost of construction is going up. The second thing I wanted to say is that because the ordinance is vague on what is actually required for paving a parking lot, um, I, I think it's entirely uh, fair and reasonable for the applicant to come in uh, circumstances have changed, cost of construction has gone through the roof, and ask for uh, relief on this issue. Um, I, I don't really see it as um, the suggestion was made, perhaps, that the applicant is asking for forgiveness instead of permission. Uh, life happens, business happens, things change, and uh, I know, for instance, if the price of lumber has gone up about 300% since last November. So I think it's entirely reasonable for someone who's trying to run a business to come in and ask for relief. And when the ordinance itself is not specific about what is required for paving, um, I think it's absolutely fair that he asked for it and that we respond in a timely manner. Um, I do think um, 
Carol Ann has asked a good question. What will be stored there when it's not flower season? Um, but again, a lot of businesses do some outside storage. So people go into business and they realize that their business plans change a little bit. I think we need to be a little open to that. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Jamie. Yes, I appreciate the comments from Jonathan and Marianne. Um, I, I would agree that with Marianne that the ordinance is vague. And I also appreciate her reference to section 19-7-8, which I think that uh, accepting the way that she read it into the record is, I would submit that the applicant has already complied with that section of the ordinance as well, because that had to do with drainage. Um, the, the engineer could speak to that better, but um, I'm a, I would, we would submit that they're compliant with that section of the ordinance. With regards to what Jonathan had to say, uh, if there's a suggestion that we're requesting a deviation from the, the ordinance, that, that's not what we're requesting. We're, it's our position, our firm position that the ordinance doesn't require it. So if, if we want to have the town attorney analyze whether or not the ordinance requires it, I, I suppose that's an expense we could incur. But, um, and of course it's up to the council if they want to draft an ordinance that's clear that requires paving of parking lots, but there's nothing in the ordinance that currently addresses it other than what Marianne uh, brought up and what's in the subdivision ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, any other comments? Do I have a motion to table? Hey, Jim, I just noticed the, the applicant is in the attendee with his hand up. So I'm not sure if- Oh, no, I don't, it doesn't show on mine. You see him, Maureen? Yes. Okay. I guess, Michael, if you are on, if your mic's on, go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Mike Friedland and uh, owner of the property, owner of the Lumbery. Thanks for your time. Um, I did get, I sent out to all the pavers that gave us estimates to try and find out the, the tonnage. And it's, uh, I got from BS Ingraham that they are approximately um, 140 tons of mix, but their cost varies due to the fluctuation cost of liquid asphalt and petroleum based products. So it was difficult just to get a price from these paving companies in terms of how much it costs. But uh, as everyone has stated, the, the five estimates I've got were all about the $24,000, $25,000. And um, I also want to say that, um, yes, the top coat was in my originally approved site plan. And uh, in my na naivety, because I've never done paving, I actually didn't even know it was in there. Um, and so when I was getting bids from pavers, they said, uh, to have your lot paved is X amount. And if you want a top coat, it's going to be X amount more. And uh, as a business owner, where I'm trying to balance um, who I pay and when I pay and trying to keep things um, afloat, if I'm given the option of having to pay for something that's not required or not paying for something that's not required, um, I choose to try and go the, the, the common sense, sensible route, especially since uh, starting a new business. And I definitely want to keep uh, capital as free as possible. And um, um, I was not trying to shirk my responsibilities that were approved in the site plan, but um, the, the purpose of amendments are because site plans are, are not a, uh, they're not concrete. They're, they change when situations change. And that is the purpose of amendments is that um, you sort of see what was approved and then you realize as things are progressing that they don't make sense or they're not required. And then um, I reapproach the planning board and I, and I ask for changes based upon sort of what has happened. Um, and, and Jamie was, was very good explaining it as well as Brandon. Um, uh, I, I had no concept of what my business would be. All I had was a vision and sort of 
And then I'm faced with real day challenges. No one's coming in, things aren't working. Maybe we put some stuff out front. Um, so it, it, it's not, it was not an intent to, to disrespect the, the board and the approved plan. It's just, um, it's trying to make a business work. Um, um, so I, I appreciate everyone's time, but in regards to top coat also, um, we've been open since November and we've driven our forklift over it and we've had deliveries and trucks and um, the, the pavement's beautiful. It's in great shape and all the pavers that came out commented what, what a beautiful parking lot it is. And they did not see any issues with it. And um, none of them thought that my lot needed a top coat. They were willing to give an estimate for it, but none of them thought that it actually needed it. Um, and those guys are all professional pavers. Um, so uh, my request is that we could forgo this just so I could use those funds um, in other ways, especially to help buffer my business. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, any other comments by the board? Any motions by the board? Uh, just Jim, one question. Yeah. Mike, are we gonna see any more information about food trucks? It wasn't in this application. I'm just wondering if it's down the road. Um, you know, at this time it's tabled. I, I'm working with Jamie to figure out because there are legal issues within the deed. And, um, and then there's other issues with um, its allowance and then just everything that goes along with it. So my, my goal is to sort of just try and get the most basic items approved so that I could make sure that I get my certificate of occupancy. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Anything else? I should say, Michael, that this your store looks good. As you're driving by, you've made the, the outside, the appearance is, is, it looks very good. I wanted to say that uh, as a compliment to you. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Any, any motions? Twist any arms. Motion to table. Go ahead, Jonathan. Motion to table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Yam Yam LLC for amendments to the site plan approved for 287 Ocean House Road to alter outdoor storage and eliminate a finish pavement coat be tabled to the June 15, 2021 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. I have a second. A second. Maureen, please take a roll. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. No. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. It's five to one. Five to one. Thank you very much. Next Thank item on time. what's that? Thank you for your time. Okay. Next Thank item you. agenda. Carwoods Condominium Development. Andrew Carr is requesting major subdivision review for creation of a single family lot and 19 condominiums and a resource protection permit for alteration of 11,789 square feet of wetland on combined lots located in the vicinity of 10 Deep Root Road, Deep, Deep Brook Road, U6-91, 91A, 92, 94A, 95, section 16-2-4, major subdivision completeness, and section 19-8-3, resource prote uh, protection permit completeness. Okay, uh, who do we have for the applicant to present the project? Should be Travis Letelier. Okay, I saw his name on there. Travis, you round? Yep. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. So, you, are you going to uh, put your screen sharing up, or is Maureen going to put something up? I, I really think Travis, you should be doing this. Yep. Um, I think you got to give me the rights, though. Absolutely. I'm going to make you a host right now. It is yours. Um, All right. 
All right, everybody can see my screen now? Yes. All right, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Travis Letelier, uh, here to represent Andy Carr, the owner app applicant of the project um, in his, his subdivision proposal for um, uh, his single family lot, along with a 19 unit condominium development. Um, With that said, I'm going to go over some high points and then um, focus on some of the completeness items that uh, have been brought up in the memo and, and a few of the public comment letters. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. So the project, uh, I mean, you've seen this a couple of times in, in sketch plan. Um, the, the project is involving nearly 1,900 feet of road. Um, uh, nearly a thousand feet will be within a private right of way um, acting as a, as a private road to provide frontage to um, the single family uh, house lot. And then beyond that will be a more of a condominium road uh, driveway, but it will, it will be matching the same road standards as the private road uh, in the front. I, I will note that um, both the name Deep Brook Road and also the name of the, of the division of the sort of development Carwoods and Deep Brook Road um, are, are more placeholders at the moment. We're, we're still um, developing some uh, other names and, and we'll be going through the naming process uh, a little bit later. But as far as you know, everything right now, these are, these are sort of placeholders uh, for the moment, Deep Brook Road. It, it won't be named Deep Brook Road at the end of the, at the, end of the process. Um, we will be connecting to uh, the public utilities within in the road. Uh, the water and sewer system within the development will be a private system. We'll be connecting to obviously the public uh, infrastructure, but um, the actual actual water lines and sewer lines on the property will be a private uh, privately held system um, by the condo development. That's um, per per the conversation I've had with Portland Water District so far. Um, and to that respect that uh, we are in the works um, with getting the capacity letters for all the utilities on, on, the, on the proposed development, uh, water, sewer, um, electric, and gas. Um, I would like to go through some of the completeness items. Um, that's, uh, that's within Maureen's uh, memo, um, if you don't mind. As far as um, right title interest, I think I think the only outstanding item with the, with respect to that is is the sort of like a connection to the stormwater system. Um, I don't believe that there is actually a, an easement um, from our property that goes to the right of way that that. That is within that is for that stormwater system. I will note that, you know, the basically entire lot does drain there, in, in the existing conditions. Um, in addition to a lot of the actual, um, a lot of the butter lots um, actually drain onto our property through that same system as well. So um, that's something I've got to investigate a little bit long, a little bit more. But you know, if there if there is no easement actually um, involved, we will be looking to. Um, get something in order to uh, to drain to that site because that's essentially where where the site drains to. Um, <clears throat> the water supply and, and other other I, I just mentioned that we are um, looking at getting the um, ability to serve letters from the utilities. Uh, those are all pending at the moment. We don't have them in hand at the moment, um, but uh, um, typically that's something we are working on. Uh, Throughout the, pro throughout the planning process. Um, there was um, a note about the erosion control uh, plan and also the stormwater management plan. Um, um, as far as that goes, we are, you know, we, we've proposed a, a, certain, a certain way to model this, the entire site. And um, through the review engineers process, you know, we've, uh, He's identified a few areas where he'd like to see a little bit more detail. Um, I, you know, I've gone through this process uh, many times and 
I found that every review engineer looks at a model in a different way. So <laughs> um, usually I, I receive a number of comments based on their particular way to model a site or, or the way that they typically like to see things. So um, in that respect, I, I, you know, I think that's something that we'll easily be able to work out. I didn't see any, any fatal flaws in the comments that he was looking for. He was just looking for some additional details. Um, the same thing with the erosion control plan. You know, I've, I've, I've submitted a similar type plan to uh, many other municipalities and review engineers and, and haven't had similar comments, but um, you know, every, everybody reviews these plans uh, differently. So I, I will, uh, we'll go back and forth on those, on those two items and, and hammer out uh, exactly what he's looking for. I, I feel, I'm confident that uh, we'll be able to work that out uh, you know, within the next, you know, month or so to make sure we have a, a good, uh, a good plan in place. Um, <clears throat> the financial and technical capability. Um, Maureen mentions in the memo about the, the technical ability to construct the project. Um, that's as missing. And, and typically at this point in the process, we don't have a contractor selected. So, um, as far as you know, the ability to build the project, um, we don't have anybody on board uh, as of yet. And um, just, I was just looking at the actual submission requirements, and it does mention um, <coughs> consultants. You know, uh, it's, the way I read that is basically design consultants uh, for the technical capacity, um, which we we have submitted. Obviously, NCS, the soil scientist, traffic engineer, and um, a landscape architect as, as professionals who have worked on this plan. Um, there is also a question about the, the, the landscaping plan, about uh, certain planting techniques. Um, that's certainly something we can um, um, get more detail on for a, for a following submission. Um, and then um, there's also there was also a note about the community um, impact analysis uh, statements. Um, as far as the submission requirements, it, it notes that the planning board may ask for something like this. And um, I had held off on going through that entire report until until we got it into the planning board and and you actually, I guess, asked for that report. Um, um, but I think a lot of the items that are that are listed in that impact analysis, like traffic and stormwater, are are already addressed within the submission that we that we that we brought up. But um, you know, there are also economic issues that that would be in that report that uh, aren't part of the submission. And and uh, as far as as far as completeness, um, we didn't we didn't feel like that was a necessary item right at the get go because uh, because of the statement about uh, asking for it from the planning board. And as far as um, I'd like to address open space, um, at the Conservation Commission meeting we had um, last week, it was brought up that there were some, some areas of the site uh, that we were counting as open space that uh, were less than 50 feet. And you know, if we didn't count that as part of the ordinance um, requirement that, um, you know, we, we would be below the, the 45% uh, mark. Um, with that in mind, I, I did, look, did take a second look at the open space and did reconfigure things a little bit. Um, uh, you have a plan similar to this um, in your packet, but this is, a, this is sort of a redrawn open space plan. And um, I just wanna go through that a little in a little bit more detail. Um, it says in the ordinance requirement that uh, to the greatest extent possible, open space shall be conveyed in large contiguous blocks. Um, I guess the way, the way I'm, I'm reading that is we're providing these three sort of large blocks of open space. Um, and, on, and on sort of my reconfigured plan, these open space areas that we're showing do constitute 45% of the overall land. Um, I do, we do have sort of short strips in the back of these properties that, that um, are, are, we're still counting, we're still showing as open space, but we aren't counting that area as part of the overall 45%. 
And there's also a small strip over here that we aren't counting as well. Um, I will note that you know all of the open spaces you know are connected through the actual roadway system and the sidewalk. Um, you can get to all of these open space blocks uh, you know via that via that, that that sidewalk and road system. And we are also providing a public access way through the entire lot to the town owned land um, to the west of the property. Um, you know, the, the ordinance section notes that we can't count these strips that are less than 50 feet unless we add a public access way. Um, and uh, I guess I guess that's sort of what I'll, I'll need a little bit of clear, uh, you know, clearing up from the board on how that regulation is going to be applied here, whether, you know, we're providing blocks of open space or it has to be a single contiguous block. Um, or, you know, if, if we need to, we are actually willing to add sort of pathways out behind these properties to connect everything to, to meet that ordinance. But that would be sort of something of a last resort only if, if the board, you know, deemed that necessary. Um, I know we, we originally looked at putting paths, something like that with the, with the sketch plans. And that was something that was um, universally, you know, not liked by much, many of the neighbors. Um, it's not something we would like to do either, um, but um, it's, I guess, based on the nature of the property, it's tough to find one area that would be the, the open space um, rather than these sort of three large, three smaller blocks that we're proposing. Um, with that, I think, I think that, that goes over most of the completeness items that um, were in the memo. Um, I'm more than willing to answer any questions, go over any other details that the board might have. Um, you know, we're, we've got the we've got the review memo from the peer review engineer and the public works director and and um, and the town memo. We're, we're we're working on addressing all of those comments, but obviously we haven't we haven't gone through and addressed everything before the meeting today, but. Um, that's something we're working on, and um, as far as completeness, I, I think for the most part we're 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 just about there. Um, but uh, you know, if if there are items that uh, you'd like to see more information on, that uh, yeah, I'd certainly like to discuss that with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Travis. Now we'll um, open up for public comment, and I want to remind the public that. This discussion, this public comment is, uh, period is for completeness only. Do we have the information to then discuss? Not whether you agree with it or not, but do we have the information? So please focus your comments on that uh, and be brief. And um, because it's as late as it is, we wanna keep driving this forward. Um, so with that, public comment period is open and I think you'll have three minutes maximum to uh, give your comments. So Maureen, I guess I'll turn it back to you to see if anybody's raising their hands. So Travis, I'm gonna need oh. to, for you to make me the host again. Yep, one second. Okay. I just did it, you should be all set. Thank you. All right, first one is uh, Brandon Mazar. Looks like you're muted, Brandon. There you go. Good evening, thank you uh, for the time, uh, Chair Hubner and members of the uh, planning board. My name is Brandon Mazur. I'm an attorney at Perkins Thompson, and our firm represents Eric and Jennifer Johansson, who are abutters to this project. Uh, I had circulated earlier today uh, a letter laying out uh, specifically a number of concerns regarding the completeness of this application, uh, and I hope you all had a chance to receive that and review it. Um, I think the applicant. I tried to address some of them this evening, but there were still a lot of unanswered questions. And I think in the prior project that you were just reviewing, it was mentioned by a couple of the board members. Uh, you know, it's typically easy to get 
completeness achieved and, and it's an odd situation unless it's there are substantial uh, issues still outstanding and we would offer that there are still substantial issues outstanding. Uh, um, the right title and interest of whether or not their stormwater can actually drain and whether or not they have an easement is still an open-ended question. Uh, the open space, I think, is still an open-ended question that needs clarity. Um, whether or not this board wants a community impact analysis, uh, we believe there should be one. Uh, it's unclear without that if this truly does meet the comprehensive plan. Uh, again, um, we also feel as though the wetland report was incomplete and should be sub supplemented with the requirements of the conservation committee that also uh, suggested that this is an incomplete application. And finally, uh, there was uh, in uh, the town planner's memo, a suggestion that a waiver is going to be required for uh, submitting a high intensity soil survey, which is a requirement. Uh, I believe you received a, a correspondence from Mr. Peters, who's I believe a, another neighbor, who is a licensed geologist that was much more articulate and scientific than I could be in my letter. But this is uh, an issue with how much bedrock is actually on the project and some of the locations and whether or not this layout actually could work. And without that high, ten high intensity soil survey, I think you will be lacking information. So for all of those reasons, I would offer that this is one of those uh, non-normal situations where this needs to be deemed incomplete until some of these additional items can be addressed. And I, I think it would be naive to think that all of these items uh, in, in Ms. O'Mara's uh, memo, there were at least 13, uh, can be addressed within the next month's time adequately for this to go to public hearing. Uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions, but we appreciate your time uh, in understanding this uh, situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brandon. I see Maya Cohen's name up next. Go ahead, Maya. Can, can, can. Hi, uh, this is uh, Mylan Cohen and Maya Cohen. We uh, reside at 21 Surf Road. Uh, in Cape Elizabeth. And um, we would just like to say that actually Attorney Mazur uh, covered all of our concerns that we would have stated to the board and we support his, uh, his statement of concerns and uh, incompleteness. And also that uh, we are skeptical that um, the applicant could address all of those concerns uh, within one month for public comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, especially for your brevity. Um, Andre, I guess Duquette, is that how you say it? Please, yeah, please uh, keep your comments on, about completeness, not to the merits of the project. Uh, yes, uh, so I'm attorney Andre Duchette. I represent uh, Sheila Wellahan, uh, who's a resident uh, 24 Rocky Hill Road, is also in a butter. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, Brandon's earlier comments he essentially has uh, touched upon um, essentially the same list that we had with regards to our concerns. I'd also suggest that the uh, planning board uh, take into consideration its own conservation committee recommendations and that the resource protection permit application is incomplete. In addition to that, um, one, one item that hasn't been raised or at least I haven't seen that yet is with respect to uh, the open space requirement relative to the land donation. It did get brought up at the conservation committee, but I didn't see it in the report. And that's that none of the property is being donated uh, either to the town or to uh, conservation trust or anything along those lines, uh, which is uh, set out in your, in your ordinance standards relative to subdivision review. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's seek seeking to be waived Right now, the applicant has indicated that the open space will be um, left in the control of the of the associations for the use of the association. Um, and then even then, even if it was later suggested that such a change uh, would would be made in terms of a land donation, uh, I think they have some issues with respects to whether or not 20% of that is not in the resource protection zone and a slope not to exceed uh, 15%. Um, so those, those would continue to be uh, issues that this particular applicant would have 
And again, those, those items are not addressed. Um, and again, another comment that was brought up at the conservation committee um, is with respects to the sanitary waste uh, and stormwater flows and whether or not the existing structures that are there are, are suitable. I know they're uh, waiting for confirmation letters uh, from uh, Portland Public Sewer Department, um, but there's there are some real concerns with, with respects to the existing uh, pumps that are in that area. Um, and again, I think given the, the size of this uh, project and the particular topography in that particular area and the, uh, and the amount of bedrock, which has been brought up in several letters presented to this planning board, I think these are items that kind of need to be addressed out of the gate and can't just be um, uh, brushed aside at this preliminary review process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, going forward, I see a couple more hands up, but before I do that, just if you are just echoing comments that have already been said, uh, just in the, in the interest of being efficient with our time, um, we don't need to hear them again, but if you have something that hasn't been stated, then please go ahead. I see, well, that eliminated that, didn't it? There we go. Uh, Richard Blake, you have your hand up and you're, you're muted right now. There you go. Thank you. Um, I've been watching this project closely and I've seen most of the communications to Maureen and the planning board. And based on the contact, content of those communications, I do not see how this project could be, uh, uh, the application could be deemed complete at this point in time. There are so many outstanding questions and one of the key ones is the stormwater easement. So why are we even talking about this until they uh, verify that they have access for the stormwater easement? So I do not think this application is anywhere near complete and should be remanded back to the applicant to complete all the information so we are not second guessing when we go to the next stage in the process. Thank you. Mr. Blake, can I have your address? Two Ivy Road, Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on completeness? Going once, uh, Cole Peters. You're muted. I'm unmuted now, thank you for you pointing go. that out. Um, my name is Cole Peters. I live at One Ivy Road here in Cape Elizabeth. And um, although um, uh, my earlier uh, written comments uh, focused on the extent of bedrock, uh, picking up on the stormwater management system, um, I, I am not a stormwater engineer, but I reviewed the report. Uh, and what I uh, found striking in the stormwater management report with regard to speaking to existing and proposed runoff uh, was there, there was very little discussion uh, regarding the, the contact uh, filtration system. Um, it was, I, I saw no reference to that what it, whatsoever in the report in regard to treatment of water quality. And um, I think it was intimated earlier that most of the drainage uh, on the site um, is conveyed to the eastern end uh, uh, at present and will be so in the future. Uh, however, um, I would submit that in reviewing the plan uh, before us now, that um, perhaps in the end, as the stormwater um, report notes, it ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. I think most land east of the Mississippi does so. Uh, and, and it seems very vague in that regard. And I don't believe it was identified until the uh, report by Sebago Technics that it wound up at Casino Beach. And I think that's a very critical matter that the board needs to look into. I think that what is displayed on the plan before you suggests that, um, you know, the large wetland um, behind the, the car house property uh, may in fact uh, drain to the south. It would appear there's an outlet there. And um, so I think that uh, while in fact water may exit that route and end up in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, I think that, you know, 
the, the drainage of the site may be more elaborate than is suggested in the stormwater report. That's my comment. That that information needs to be clarified, please. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on completeness? Going once, going twice. The public comment period is closed. Um, uh, yes, we'll, we'll open up to the board for uh, a finding of completeness. But first, uh, I have a question for me for Maureen. Um, tell me about the impact statement. Is that a requirement for every project, or is that something we the we board have to has? Talk about? Yeah, the board has usually required it for projects of this size. Um, so I remember um, probably the one that. Uh, was the best received by the board was done by Cross Hill, Leighton Farms, um, I believe Maxwell Woods and Cottage Brook all did those um, those studies, and you know that's why the planning board has workshops so that applicants can ask the board about um, things that they're hoping to expect when the formal submission comes in. Okay, thank you. And again, before. Before I open it up, I, I see Andrew, your hands up, but um, Travis, do you have any comments on the public's comments? Um, as, as far as the first stormwater goes, um, you know, we're, we're required to you know, not increase the, you know, the, the peak flows within the site. And that's, and that's what you know, my, my proposal does. We, we are proposing a, a, a pretty elaborate underground detention system that uh, will detain um, the majority of the stormwater coming off the buildings and the road um, and will go through the contact filter. Um, and, that's, and that's part of the comments from the peer review engineer that you would like you know, some additional details on that system. And, and I, I agree with him on those on those points. So um, it's something that we'll, I'll be following up with him on as well. But as far as as far as peak flows, we, you know, the existing site drains to a certain point that, that does connect to the system in the road that does, you know, fairly quickly go to the Atlantic Ocean. That's sort of, that's sort of the, the basis of, of why that was in the report. Um, you know, if we, if we were flowing to a river, I would, I would basically, you know, note that, but since we're so close to the ocean, um, it, it, was, uh, it was appropriate to note that that's where we were, we're headed. Um, and, you know, matching the existing flow is, is, is a big deal. You know, if, you know, if this system can handle the flows in the existing condition, um, it's assumed that uh, if we can match those existing flows, peak flows, that um, the system will be able to handle that. But um, it's certainly, uh, as far as the easement across these two properties um, that the system does, um, end up into, that's something we have to look into a little further. Um, I don't anticipate anything coming out of it. And if, and if easements aren't going to be something we'll be able to get, um, I don't think it'll be too difficult to route it to another another system within the road um, that abuts our property. So um, I, don't, I don't see any fatal flaw with that, but it's something we have to investigate a little bit more and get some more detail on. Um, as far as as far as bedrock, um, I will I will say that what we're showing on the plan is from so our original project, which is, was to do a boundary survey on this property, and uh, you know without without any any indication of a future project or going out there with any you know preconceived notions of what we were going to do out there. So we, we went out with the survey. Um, our survey crew did a boundary on topo of the entire lot. They noted that these were the areas of the you know, exposed bedrock that are, that are on the site. Um, I, you know, as, as, far as, as far as a high intensity soil survey, yes, you know, that might, it might identify some depth of, of the bedrock. I mean, I will note that th th this is uh, Andy Carr's house right now. Um, and there's a very large uh, outcrop of, uh, exposed bedrock right over here. 
and he, he's very close, but he was able to put in a full foundation without blasting, without doing anything. So I, I just that, I just want to note that, that there is going to be a, you know, a, a fair amount of volatility in the depth of the, of, the, of the bedrock out there. And the areas we have identified are the exposed areas of bedrock that our survey crew identified. I've, I've been out there on a several occasions and, and you know, these seem very accurate to me. Um, there might be some, you know, small rocks and, and, and whatnot along the area that, that look like possible, maybe outcroppings of bedrock, but, you know, a couple square feet here and there. Um, I will note that, you know, uh, calculating density um, on the overall lot with what we're showing now, it comes out to about 26 units. Um, we're obviously we're limited on the dead end road standard to 19. Um, but to, to decrease our density to below what would be you know, allowed with this development, we'd have to identify another uh, like 105,000 square feet of exposed bedrock. Um, and just, just to note that this, this lot here that we're carving out for Andy is, is 62,000 square feet. So, um, I mean, I, I understand that might be some, you know, possibly some small, small areas um, that uh, that might have, have been missed on the initial survey. But as far as large areas of outcropping, um, these are these are what we picked up on our initial survey um, without any sort of bias on what we were, what the project was going to become after that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, no, that, that's all for now. I think. Okay, Andrew. Thanks. Um, I think the stormwater uh, modeling and calculations and, and related things uh, sort of give me the most pause with this. I don't think I've ever seen this many comments about stormwater modeling on any project from the consulting engineer. And, you know, a, a lot of it may be, uh, you know, minor. Um, we do see a lot of that sort of, and there, there are certainly discrepancies in how uh, any engineer or scientist or whatever is going to look at uh, a model or approach modeling something. And I, and I get that certainly. But, you know, a few things sort of related to that are, you know, I, I don't know, not being a, a soil or a water engineer about whether or not the, the high intensity soil samples would actually improve the, the modeling. And then, um, you know, subsequent to that, I think my biggest sticking point really is, is the easement issue um, with the existing infrastructure they're tying into. To me, that seems like a glaring hole right now in the application. And, you know, I know he just kind of glossed over it uh, um, saying that, you know, well, if they couldn't get the easement, then they could kind of maybe do something else, but, but we don't know what that is or if that's even possible. So I think really without even getting into that and, and at least finding out if that easement is possible and then if it isn't what an option for something else, I, I don't, I can't see how this is complete enough in my eyes anyway. Thank you, Andrew. Jonathan. Sorry, yeah, um, it, it, I, I agree with what Andrew just said as well. One other thing I wanted to bring up and just get information from the applicant, uh, <clears throat> and maybe I'm, I'm missing this, but in the traffic study that was um, brought in and I, I looked at the traffic study and I looked at the engineer's comments on it, was there anything that addressed the the timing, that fact that um, basically it was done during a pandemic and we, was there anything that addresses that in the traffic study itself? I saw the dates that it was, um, uh, came from last summer, I think it was August of 2020, but I'm just wondering if there was any sort of consideration of that or any uh, thing that you looked at for numbers in 2019, anything you can point to me um, on that or whether or not there was any factor uh, that would come into play on that. Yep, um, so there is a section in the traffic report called adjusted peak hour volume. Um, there's a whole section that goes into his methodology on where he got his numbers, how he adjusted them. Um, you know, he, uh, he got a hold of actually some DOT numbers from um, the year before um, the, his counts, which were, were happened in like the year COVID summer last year. Um, and actually the numbers for the 2019 were were less than the 2020 numbers. Um, so, you know, he, he goes into um, all of those details um, in his report. 
Okay. Daniel. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Jim. I, I, I've got a couple of points and just a, one of them, Jonathan, you got to the traffic before me, but um, uh, our, our town engineer had a comment. It's number 45 about uh, our town standards um, recommend that site distance be measured at a location 15 feet behind the edge of travel way, um, opposed to the main DOT standard, which is 10 feet. So there's, so his question is, is, you know, um, uh, it's, it uh, uh, did the traffic, it appears the traffic engineer did not do that, but I didn't, I didn't, um, um, you know, uh, totally study that the traffic report. Uh, so a question to Travis. And then another question has to do with, um, and Maureen, this is something that has to do with the resource protection permit that um, the applicant um, submitted um, or has submitted a medium intensity soils study. Um, and from what I understand, um, just in kind of studying this a little bit, that high intensity soil studies are a great way to kind of, um, you know, find a, um, a ledge. It's just a, you know, a more intense study. So if the applicant can, um, you know, answer, you know, why um, he may be just submitting a medium um, uh, intensity study versus high intensity. I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we, don't have a, have a great answer, but um, I think, I think, you know, we, we, we were thinking that as far as, as far as, you know, stormwater flows and, and whatnot as soil how it how it infiltrates and whatnot. The the medium intensity survey is pretty a pretty good uh, a way to model that. Um, as far as a high intensity soil survey, um, you know it would it, it may identify some shallower some bedrock areas, um, but I think I think I, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that there there is going to be some bedrock, uh, you know ex, you know some some rock found at some of these locations. Um, and um, you know, we, we 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 did submit a blasting plan for for the eventuality that th those those items would be found. Um, but um, you know, and as far as as far as sight distance, that um, that was just uh, something we missed in the ordinance. So um, we'll, the traffic engineer will be going back out to remeasure that. Uh, I don't anticipate anything changing um, just because of how good the site distance is at this location, but um, that's something we'll be updating in the next, uh, next submission. Thank you, uh, Carol Ann. Uh, I'm gonna go to the resource protection permit, the comments on completeness that are included on page two of the, of the meeting packet. The fact that you have not formally requested any waivers and and I will tell you right now that I would not be in a favor of a waiver of high intensity soils study. Um, you submitted two, two foot contours instead of one foot contours. And there's a question about five wetlands and, and that two will be impacted, but it looks like there's alteration in all, but that could be a misunderstanding of the plan. So I just want you to explain where the alterations to wetlands are. But these are all completeness issues that um, need to be addressed. Yep. Um, as far as the two foot and one foot contours, I I understood that to be showing one foot design contours that would give you an accurate depiction of the toe of slope, which would give you the accurate depiction of the actual impacts of the wetlands. Um, I didn't I didn't read that as providing one foot contours on the existing conditions plan. Um, but um, that's something we can we can certainly uh, revise uh, very easily with the with the with the with the terrain model that we've got. So um, we can we can model that again as a as one foot contours. But as far as, as far as how I read that, I I thought that was design contours, which we are providing one one foot design contours that give us a, a, a good a good um, you know depiction of, of where the toe of slope and the actual impacts of the wetlands are. So in, in, the, in the wetlands report, it does 
um, identify all of the, the five wetlands. So we have wetland, wetland A over here. Oop, wetland, I think this is wetland A, wetland B, wetland C, wetland D, and wetland E, way in this little, this little guy in the back. Um, his report reflected um, a very, very, very preliminary design of a, of a condo development that had a road and a different, a slightly different location. So he, when he was noting the actual locations of impact, you know, it was, it was with a different report. You know, we, we do in our plan set identify, you know, there's an impact here, a small impact here, a small impact, this wetland, um, wetland to, uh, impact to wetland D here. Um, and those are all identified within the plans as, uh, uh, as impact areas and, and will be in our, in our, you know, our DEP permit as well. Um, apologize. I have I have that I have that report here somewhere. What were the other two items? I, I apologize. Uh, the um, other one was just my comment that I'm not in favor of waiving a high intensity soil survey. Okay. Okay. That's, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but. Okay. Um, Jonathan. Um, Brandon, are you planning on doing a, uh, a community impact analysis? You're not looking for a waiver on that, are you? Or Travis, sorry, I called you Brandon. That was the last one. I'm sorry. What was <laughs> sorry, Travis. Um, you're not looking for a community impact analysis waiver, are you? Um, I, I guess I'm just I'm looking for guidance from you if, if that's something you're going to require. I, I, I apologize. I didn't yes, ask, for, I, ask this question at the workshop. I, yeah, I, I, I would I would want to see one before. Okay. I agree, Jonathan. I would too. Yes. Any other would I? Um, Marianne, I see your hand. Are you all done, Jonathan? Yes, thanks. Yeah, Marianne. Okay, um, just a, a couple of things. I note that the community impact analysis is not, it, it's not really an issue of waiver because we may require it, but it's not among the things that are always required. So I agree with those of you who've said you'd like to see a community impact analysis. Um, but it's not something where I would say the application is incomplete because it hasn't come up with that because we haven't asked them yet. So clearly we wanna make sure we're asking them that tonight. Um, I also, I think the application is incomplete. It seems to me that some of the um, issues are just no brainers that they should have come in with a, a more complete application. Um, the right title and interest, the uh, letters from the utilities. Um, those are things I just want to see early on um, before we spend a lot of time looking at the application. So I would uh, be voting tonight that the application is not complete. Thank you, Marianne. I was and just one last point, though, yeah. um, yep. if I can. Um, the waivers that they've asked for on the resource protection, this is why I brought this up earlier on the first item that was on our agenda, where two of those waivers were waivers that we granted the town as applicant. And now here we are two hours later, um, having some trouble, I think, some agita over uh, granting the same waiver to a private applicant. So I really uh, hope the planner will bring back to the town that um, the town should not be asking for these waivers. Um, I, I will just say from my perspective, it's the, it's the size of the project. This is, this is a major, major development. Putting in some boardwalks is a totally different animal. So yeah. that's where my 
that's where my thinking on the waivers comes from. Uh, uh, Carol Ann, I, I agree. The size is significant. It just, it strikes me that it's very hard when the it's applicant a, is yeah. itself, when the applicant is itself the town. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I get it. Um, Could I just clarify? Yeah. The applicant in this application has not asked for any waivers. Okay. Wait, These yeah. are things that were not included, was speculated that they may. Okay. Trying, to get, trying to get them over that hump. Okay. Who's, so, well, I guess I'm a little confused then, Maureen, yeah. on page two of your memo, where you say likely will request a waiver and uh, under resource protection permit, then you have number two and number six. And it seems to me that's the summary of completion. So that, that's me trying to throw the applicant a hint <laughs> that when they made their presentation, that would have been a good time if they were gonna ask for a waiver since they did, didn't put it in the written materials. Okay. Yes. All right. You done, Marianne? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew. Well, to clarify, actually, in their application, it does say waivers. We are asking for a waiver from the requirement to show all trees over six inches. That's so right. So there, there is one. They are specifying outright in the in the plan. Just, just. That. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um. I don't know it's just overall. I guess I'm, I'm obviously I'm speaking for myself. There's just so much, so many unanswered questions. I'm leaning towards it not being complete. So I mean, I, I don't know how much more we want to talk about this, but I see Jonathan. Yeah, I have a motion. Oh, did, did I hear that? <laughs> I Go guess ahead. you did. My motion is be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Andrew Carr. For major subdivision review of Car Woods, a 19 unit condominium project and a one single family home lot and a resource protection permit for 1,789 square feet of RP2 wetland alteration located at Shore Road and 10 Deep Brook, Brook Drive be deemed incomplete. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Maureen, I saw you have your hand up, or was that? I understand it's very late. I had a couple of things I just wanted to bring up because I think that they could have a significant impact on the design of the project and the applicants going back and doing some reworking. It just seems only fair to bring them up now. But if, if you want me to hold it off for another meeting, I, I'm, I certainly understand. No, well, is that a discussion that staff that you could have with the applicant, Maureen? Well, I can suggest things to them. I think it has more weight when the board says, yeah, we think that might make sense or no, we're not that concerned. Okay. I would like to hear that, Maureen, please. Hold on, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go as quickly as I can. And uh, the first one is, and this is coming out of staff review, not just me. Uh, I, I do think that the applicant needs to be able to walk us through the entire the entire path of the stormwater flows. Because from what we can understand, water is sort of flowing into Deep Brook Road and then it's getting into the filtration system. And then I believe it's entering some private stormwater infrastructure and then it's getting into the public right of way. And the information is that there are serious concerns that the private stormwater infrastructure is inadequate right now. So just keeping the flows below what they are right now isn't going to get you over the concern of flooding properties because there's, there's anecdotal information, there's experiential information that, that those areas are flooding right now. Um, the second one is, is really the wetlands seem to be I, I don't know what to say, but right now you're proposing about 12,000 square feet of wetland alteration. And the question really is, why did the road move? Because it appears that a significant amount of wetland alteration is happening 
because the road moved from uh, the Deep Brook Road entrance to the new location. And if there were reasons why, it would be nice if that was articulated in your application. Further, it would be good to know, even if it's not exact, what would have been the wetland alteration proposed if the road had stayed in the same place? And again, again to talk about the wetlands, uh, there is a standard under the resource protection permit that shows that you have not, that there wasn't any alternative to altering the wetland and that's why it was altered. And I think that unit four and five feels very problematic because the only reason that wetland is getting altered is because you had to move the wetland, the road into the wetland in order to create a building location for those two condominiums. So uh, going down the road, I don't know if the board will be able to find that you've met the standard that you've minimized the alteration to the extent possible. Um, and then the last thing is, I, I know you talked about the 50 foot strips and that there could be a chance to put trails in there, but the way this is currently designed, uh, significant portions of those 50 foot strips have two to one slopes. And while uh, we like our rustic trails and we don't mind if they're not ADA accessible, two to one probably is a little too much uh, side slope for us to be able to legitimately call it a, a trail. So that, that's, that's my short list. Okay. Oh, uh, sign vital to me. Further discussion, I see, uh, before we take a vote, Marianne, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I think Maureen was trying to help us. If we vote that the application is incomplete, then we do need to identify the information needed to make the application complete. And we, do we need to do that tonight? I assume we do. I think there's a huge memo that explains what's incomplete. Yeah, I would say refer to the information provided by right. town staff. Yeah, re refer to the staff comments, I think would be the simplest way to do that. that. Well, that's what I was wondering where we're going from here. So, okay. Think, all right. We have a motion, we have a second. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, Maureen, uh, please take a vote. Certainly, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Chair Hubner. Yes. Motion is unanimous that the application is deemed incomplete. Um, and we've offered uh, guidance to refer to the staff mm -hmm. memos to assist the applicant in making it complete. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Travis. Um, the next item, no, it's, it's not, well, we had a schedule for 9.30, it's about 9.30 and- uh, yeah. With that, let's do it. I said Yeah, I don't think it'll take you awful long. Um, Edgecombe Road, private road amendment. Jay Cox is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Edgecombe Road, private road approval to delete conflicting notes regarding preservation of vegetation located between the lot two building envelope and Edgecombe Road, U26-1, section 19-7-9, private road completeness and public hearing. Is Jay here? Let's see. Is that you, Jay? It says Jay. Hoping I got the right Jay. You're muted, Jay. There you go. Oh, no. How about now? Do you hear me? Yep. You got it. Go okay. ahead. Uh, my name is Jay Cox, and I'm here for KGM LLC regarding Edgecombe Way, located at 73 Ocean House Road. In 2020, we received board approval to extend and construct the Edgecombe Way private road and have su subsequently uh, completed it. Uh, post recording, it came to our attention that we have an error on one of our drawings and we're here seeking to correct that error. Um, Maureen, can we put up the, the, uh, un the original incorrect plan of Edgecombe Way? Is 
Is that the one you want? I don't I don't see it. All I see is board yeah, members. Yeah, I don't see anything, Maureen. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I can see it, but I haven't shared it yet. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be a good sharer, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, well, I try. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, this, so this is the one you wanted? Yes, yeah. Okay. So on this plan, this is the recorded plan. Um, there's an error in a note to the front setback line for lot two. Um, specifically, it says uh, 20 foot front set building envelope setback and do C note 11. Um, Although note 11 in turn points to the site plan uh, in which all the uh, do not disturb areas are clear, uh, we would like to correct that note so that it doesn't conflict with the other drawings in the set. Also at the uh, workshop, the board suggested an additional change to the side yard setback. Could you, could you move it over to the side yard, Maureen? Right in there. There's part of that is uh, site disturb. It's about 45 feet from the uh, edge of the right of way. And we've also updated uh, a new drawing for you to look at you know, with that change as well. So now, Maureen, could you put up the, the modified one? So on, the, on this plan, there are two changes. Um, the note at the front setback area stating, do not disturb air has been deleted. And also we placed a dimension in the side yard setback. So everything, everything to the north of that line is a simple side yard setback and everything south of that is do not disturb area. And those are, those are the two changes. Uh, there's a couple other notes, but they're related to the recording. Uh, that's the only two uh, changes that we've made. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, so first, uh, next thing I do is allow public comment on completeness. Do I have anybody from the public offers any comments on this? If so, please raise your hand, uh, raise hand future. No hands are up. Seeing none. Uh, the public comment period is closed. And then uh, I'm gonna turn it back to the board for us to make a finding of completeness. Do I have any any uh, comments from the board? Any questions for Jay? I think it's pretty straightforward and simple and clean. Yes, I agree. So, would you like to yes, I would love that. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Jay Cox for amendments to the previously approved Edgecombe Way private road to correct, a conflicting, correct conflicting notes regarding activities outside the building envelope for the lot located at 4 Edgecombe Way be deemed complete. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, do I have any other comments? If not, Maureen, please call the roll. And you should know my just got my alarm that my battery is low on my computer. So while you're doing that, I'm going to run downstairs and plug in. <laughs> you want to vote first, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Chair Hubner. Chair, uh, yes. All right. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Motion passes. Um, next, we'll open it up. Do, do I need to open up for public comment on uh, the merits of the project, Maureen, or can we skip that? I think we should. Okay. 
Nothing that says you have to do it. Well, this the, when this went through originally, there's some interested abutters. So let's just see if they're here and yeah. want to come. All right. Yeah, you can open it up. I'm, I'm not seeing anyone who's going to speak, but certainly go go ahead and open it up. Yep. Open it up for public comment on the on the merits of the project to the public. If you have any comments, please raise your hands. Use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Going once, no. going twice. Public comment period is closed. Any questions on the board on the merits of the, from the board on the merits of the project, uh, Daniel? Yeah. Oh no, I I don't have any um, questions about what what Jay is is doing here. I think it's I think it's it's uh, straightforward. But if you're doing a change to the drawings, Jay, do you guys usually bubble, you know, those changes so you know what that change is? Um, just just a, 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 a question to you. Um, we could have, but I, 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 I'd say no, not in this case. This is this is what we would propose to record right here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I there is a, bubble, there isn't a there is a note on the drawing that it's an amendment to. The plan, so the recorder knows that it's a it's a amended it, plan. Okay, yeah, and that that was my that was the substance of my question. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? Do I have a motion? I have a motion for you, Jim. Go ahead, John. Uh, motion for approval. Findings of fact number one: Jay Cox is requesting amendments to the previously approved Edgecombe Way private road to correct conflicting notes regarding activities outside the building envelope for the lot located at four Edgecombe Way, which requires review under 19-7-9 private road review. Number two: The Edgecombe Way private road has been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and decisions of those approvals which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number three, uh, the Edgecombe Way amendment is in compliance with the town wetland regulations in the zoning ordinance. Number four, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of Jay Cox, uh, be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that note 11 on the second amended plan of Edgecombe Way be augmented with the statement that, quote, areas shown on sheet L-1 in crosshatch are subject to the do not, dis <laughs> quote, do not disturb, end quote, labels except that the areas in crosshatch, which is labeled, quote, utility easement, end quote, may be disturbed for utility installation, end quote. Number two, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Maureen, please take the roll. Mr. Bedinsky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Before I ask for a, a motion to adjourn, I think I get sent from Maureen what our workshop looks like in June. Um, that's a good question. Uh, hang on just a sec. I actually have I may have some information on that. I can get to it. Thank you, folks. Have a good evening. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Good thanks. night. Good night. If you can't find it, Maureen, that's fine. I'm just curious if you had it right there. We just get a well, sense. it's buried under everything else we've done tonight. That's the well, you say we've been busy tonight. What it's just buried under everything else that got opened. Um, let's see, don't sweat it if you don't. No, it's we're right here so far. So, um, CELT will be bringing in an application for additional. Boardwalks. Um, 
There you go. I, I was, and that's all I have right now. Okay. Um, I guess if that's the only one that actually submits in time, consider uh, Sam for the... Uh, yes, the Energy Committee presentation. Energy Committee, yeah. Yeah, okay, I will. I know I sent him an email. Um, I haven't heard back, but I will uh, circle back to him and see if they're interested. Okay. All right, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? If that's anybody else has any other questions. Motion we adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Come on, Jonathan. I saw you shaking your head. Do we have a motion? I just want to hang out. <laughs> he's, Go ahead, Maureen. He's still in shock. I left him hanging on that last one. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. And Chair Hubner. Yes. Hey, we'll see you guys. Uh, in June. My God, I didn't think I'd say that for a while. Yeah. Tim, I'm going to see you tomorrow night. Um, oh, that's, oh, that's right. Thank you. I guess. Is that there any you. talk about when our meetings will be in, pu in person. person, in public again? I, I will let you know as soon as I know. Um, we are opening up Town Hall June 1st. We still have capacity limits, but my guess is once those go away, we're going to be able to start meeting in person again. Good. Good. Yeah, I'm really going to awesome. miss the Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Not. All right. Good See you night. guys. Good night. Have a good, good night. night. Bye. 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 Bye, Maureen. Good Have night. A nice walk. I'm, looking, I'm looking to stop the recording so that I'll be done. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.